Hi everyone, we're going to start the webinar now. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar uh, is um, the Provincial Human Services and Justice Coordina Coordinating Committee's webinar on traumatic brain injury in the justice system. My name is Tasha Rennie and I am the Network Engagement and Communications Officer for the HSJCC Secretariat. Before we get started, I have a few things to go over for our webinar today. Um, we'll be having a Q&A period at the end of the presentation, so if you have any questions during the webinar, just feel free to type them into the chat box, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can at the end. Um, so the webinar today will be recorded, and the recording and PowerPoint presentation will be emailed to all of the participants following the webinar. Um, and we're also going to be sending out a brief evaluation survey, so we'd ask that you could fill that out um, and just to help us better plan our webinars in the future. And for anyone who is joining us for the first time, um, the Human Services and Justice Coordinating Committee Network is made up of 39 local committees, 14 regional committees, and one provincial table. So each HSJCC is a voluntary collaboration between health and social service organizations, community mental health and addictions organizations, and partners from the justice sector. So today we're joined by Dr. Flora Matheson, Dr. Catherine wiseman Hakes, and Dr. Angela Colantonio. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to our presenters. Thank you. This is um, Angela Colantonio speaking. Um, I am um, a director of the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute at the University of Toronto and a senior scientist at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute uh, at UHN. Um, and I wish to thank everyone for the opportunity to present to you today and for taking time from your busy schedules to join us. So in terms of the session overview today, um, it's on brain injury and among the criminal justice populations. Um, our aim is, first of all, to talk about our research, traumatic brain injury and mental health and addictions and vulnerable populations, um, incorporating sex and gender into our work, and what does this mean and why is it important. And also to talk about uh, traumatic brain injury in the criminal justice system, what we know and the current research program and the current research program. And also, um, at the end, how you can be involved. So I have uh, the privilege of leading a major program grant funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. And it's focused on integrating brain injury, mental health, and addiction. And we have an outstanding team. So this is not about one person, but many, many stakeholders and um, as scientists, as well as researchers, as well as trainees and staff. And um, this, the project a aims to address um, an identified long-standing major knowledge and practice gap for persons with these concurrent conditions. Therefore, our goal is to facilitate the integration of services for men and women with traumatic brain injury, mental health, and or addictions by addressing relevant knowledge gaps about these conditions, promoting meaningful cross-sectoral engagement with decision makers through research and knowledge translation activities. And we also uh, aim to integrate explicit consideration to sex and gender throughout. Um, a major strength, we believe, of our team is our um, amazing, amazing partners who are we're very much in the development of the entire process. And you can see in this slide, there is extensive and, and uh, across Ontario. And it also includes the um, uh, Provincial Choir Brain Injury Network, as well as persons with lived experience and caregivers of persons with lived experience. Uh, this is our research team, which I um, that comes, who come from uh, different uh, universities and research hospitals and um, are, are multidisciplinary. Uh, as we also have a very multidisciplinary research team which includes trainees. And by the way, I'm as a director of the uh, training program, if anyone is actually interested in, in research or uh, in this uh, population is thinking about a postgraduate degree, you can also contact me about that. Um, so a key uh, component of this research program is the promotion of meaningful cross-sectoral engagement with knowledge users 
including people with uh, persons with lived experience, caregivers of persons with lived experience, and service providers through collaboration and participation, and knowledge translation exchange activities. And additional members may be rec recommended at any time. So we feel like the research is really meaningful because people, the end users of the information are involved from the very beginning. So this is, um, this slide presents, uh, I guess, the core of the research program. Our, our aim um, is to, uh, from a very pop we use a provincial population-based data to look at to the extent to which these conditions exist concurrently, and what is the impact on the system-level outcomes, providing policy-relevant data. It's, it's kind of the, the information policy want to, makers want to know, like how many people are affected and what is the cost. Uh, another project looks at um, broad-based barriers and facilities to accessing health services um, to inform equitable access to health care. We know that our populations um, that are vulnerably housed and criminalized are, um, are disproportionately affected with these concurrent decisions. As such, we have um, a project just looking at uh, focus on critical characteristics of housing support. Um, in, to, in order to inform the design of appropriate housing models and uh, knowledge transfer materials. We also look at, um, look at gaps in knowledge and practice among frontline staff, first responders, service providers, and decision makers regarding criminalized men and women and women survivors of intimate partner violence. And we aim for this to inform the creation and evaluation of relevant education knowledge transfer materials. Um, I used to have a, a Canadian Institute for Health Research uh, chair in gender work and health, and so I this the integration of sex and gender is um, integrated throughout. And just in terms of how we use these words in the research, uh, sex typically refers to the biological and physiological characteristics that distinguish males from females, and gender typically refers to the socially constructed roles, relationships, behaviors, relative power, and other traits that societies ascribe to women and men. And we know that these constructs are often just Guest is binary context, concepts, but they're not, and uh, they're more fluid and dynamic, and um, they're interrelated and their con relationships are con uh, complex. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Matheson to talk about um, brain injury in the criminal justice system and what we know. Thanks, Angela. Um, so I'm Flora Matheson. I'm with the Center for Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital um, and the Dal Lennon School of Public Health at U of T and the uh, Center for Criminology. Um, my program of research is uh, based on uh, homelessness and problem gambling, but also prisoner health. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we know about uh, people in the justice system and <clears throat> traumatic brain injury. Um, and we'll just start off with a definition. So according to the CDC, uh, TBI or traumatic brain injury is a, a blow or a jolt to the head um, or something that penetrates the head which disrupts the function of the brain either temporarily or permanently. So this doesn't have to be an actual hit to the head. It could be um, from whiplash. It could be from a, a blast, something like that. So, and that does, um, and it doesn't matter whether you hit your head um, to have, you could still have a uh, a severe or uh, a severe brain injury. So it, it's really not the blow, but it's the extent of the damage to the brain based on what the injury was. Um, and TBI, it falls under the umbrella of acquired brain injury and includes, so that includes TBI and non-traumatic non brain injury, such as stroke, aneurysm, and anoxia. Um, we've been hearing a lot about concussion in the media, especially in sports. Um, there's a and, and so it's really kind of on the radar now in public health. Um, and it, it's defined as a temporary disturbance of brain function. Um, and the current evidence suggests that there, there's some longer term alterations in brain function associated with concussion for some individuals. Um, and it does, it can happen with a loss of consciousness, but also without a loss of consciousness. Um, so once you've had one TBI, you're really at higher risk of sustaining another TBI. And as, you know, as we've seen from hockey players, a history of multiple TBI is associated with slower recovery. Um, and you know, it's the uh, cumulative damage to the brain that causes 
more severe uh, in, uh, uh, symptoms. And as in any population within the criminal justice population, when we see TBI, it's you know it could be because of a fall, it could be because of a motor vehicle crash, it could be a sports injury. It also could be because of childhood um, um, physical trauma or domestic violence. So the, the, the causes of the brain injury in the criminal justice uh, system um, for people in the criminal justice system is, is the same as people that are, uh, are not in the criminal justice system. Um, as we know, criminal, uh, traumatic brain injury is very prevalent among uh, people in, who've been incarcerated people who've been charged um, and uh, among inmates and uh, just widespread within the criminal justice system. There was a recent study in 2017 that in their sample, there was a, about 100%, well, 100% of people of incarcerated adults had a history of uh, TBI. Now that was a small sample and I believe it was um, people who were on death row, but we know in the, in the literature that it's upwards of 80, percent and this study shows it's a hundred percent so uh, we know that this issue is widespread that it, it is uh, you know combined with other issues such as um, mental other mental health issues and with uh, addictions the rate among youth is about six anywhere from 16 to 72 percent depending on the study that you look like that look at um, adverse life experiences are common for persons with a history of uh, TBI and incarceration um, particularly for cr criminalized women. Um, there is a lot of trauma in this population, a lot of childhood uh, physical abuse, and uh, that also is a you know, risk factor for TBI. Um, the work that uh, Angela and I did on, or Dr. Colantonio and I did on um, TBI among the federal inc incarcerated population uh, we found that they were 2.5 time, 2 times more likely to be incarcerated than men and women who hadn't sustained a TBI. So those with a TBI were almost three times more likely to be incarcerated. This, is, this was in a sample of 18 to 29 year olds, so a young, a young uh, cohort, primarily male. So there is a high risk of incarceration among that population. We've just done some more recent findings have shown that you know, with uh, discretionary release, where um, they're released prior to the end of their sentence, or if for serious uh, charges within the prison, uh, the prison system, they're 14 times more likely to have a serious charge and 12 times more likely, but less likely to achieve discretionary release. So they're really at a disadvantage within the criminal justice system. And uh, Dr. Wiseman Higgs is going to talk about some of the issues on why they're on their. This is, this is a, a place where they are disadvantaged. Um, so a little bit more on what we know within the criminal justice system. Having a history of TBI, a diagnosed TBI, and or repeated hits to the head or face increases the risk of recidivism by 69%. Um, I, I would have thought it would have been higher because we know that the risk of recidivism within the first year is uh, about 50%. But Still, there is an increased risk for this population. Um, violence is both a cause and, and sequela of a TBI. Um, and for women who have had a TBI, uh, who are incarcerated, they're more likely to have been incarcerated for a violent crime. Um, this was some a research from the states. So, you know, these prevalence rates are really high. Um, they're at a significant disadvantage in the system. It really is a public health problem, and it's a hidden public health problem because we can't see this on the outside. We don't know that someone is suffering from a long-term illness um, because it's just it's not apparent. Um, maybe until they start to talk, or when they're in a stressful situation and their behaviors become potentially more aggressive. But it is a significant health health problem. But as I say, hard to see. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wiseman Hakes, and she's going to talk to you about cognition, communication, and behavior. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flora. My name is Katherine Wiseman Hakes, and uh, I actually have a clinical background in speech language pathology, and my program of research uh, has, is in the area of traumatic and acquired brain injury 
and the cognitive communication, social communication, and behavioral challenges associated with traumatic brain injury. Um, I'm also on faculty in the Department of Speech Language Pathology at McMaster University. So I'll just share with you that Flora and I just came from the uh, Toronto HSJCC meeting, and we both sit on, on the Toronto HSJCC. And interestingly, the word communication uh, was raised several times, uh, both in the presentation that we had this morning and throughout the discussion for the duration of the meeting. And it's a significant issue uh, for this population. So traumatic brain injury is associated with quite a few cognitive, communication, emotional, and behavioral uh, sequelae or symptoms. And these significantly complicate management during the period of incarceration and they also create significant barriers to uh, successful community reintegration. So you're probably familiar with some of these challenges, but just to reiterate, um, number one, most people uh, express difficulty in attention. So paying attention over periods of time, paying attention in noisy environments. Of course, if we have difficulties with attention, this impacts on our memory, because if we can't pay attention to something, then it's not likely that it's going to get into memory. Difficulties with multitasking, being able to do and handle more than one thing at a time, being able to handle more than one piece of information at a time is a challenge. Self-monitoring uh, is often a significant challenge, as well as the uh, ability to plan and organize behavior, uh, both at the stage of the planning, but then being able to actually carry out those plans. Uh, problem solving and reasoning. So there's a number of different areas uh, cognitively uh, that are compromised uh, in many individuals post-traumatic brain injury. Now these also impact significantly on our ability to communicate. We also see a number of emotional challenges and for many individuals this includes um, increased uh, emotional ability. And Given that many uh, individuals who have TBI and have been involved in the criminal justice system also have subsequent comorbidities of substance use and addictions, for those individuals who are now going through detox or withdrawal, all of a sudden this emotional lability is significantly exacerbated. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we, uh, again, depending on the nature of the brain injury, we can see uh, another group who come across with a very flat, uh, reduced affect, lack of ability to initiate, um, and these are also prevalent. So I lead you to the next term, and this is what we call cognitive communication. So what that actually means is any difficulty with an aspect of communication, and by communication we, need, we mean listening, and we go beyond listening to understanding, uh, speaking, and that is uh, being able to uh, formulate and express the content and our ideas. I'm not talking about the actual speech production. Reading, writing, and thinking, because for the most part we use language to think. And these are impacted uh, because of the underlying cognitive impairments. So you may recall I used the example of difficulty with attention, uh, so that the person has difficulty with memory. And so within the context of a conversation, the individual may forget the key points, uh, they may go off on a tangent, um, and that is because of the underlying cognitive uh, impairments. So this also includes challenges with behavioral self-regulation, and this significantly impacts social communication. So for example, um, individuals can be impulsive, they can say the wrong thing at the wrong time, uh, they can go from 0 to 30 uh, without warning and become aggressive or cry. Uh, they can also be socially vulnerable um, for a number of reasons, and I, I will uh, talk a little bit about that. So we want to take a look about how all of these things interact. It's very difficult to um, isolate. Uh, as I say, they really all do interact, and then we often superimpose other comorbidities of mental health and addictions on top of these. So at the core, we have the traumatic brain injury. Uh, we have the communication challenges that I referred to, so listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. We have the cognitive challenges, attention, memory. The ability to process information is often significantly slowed. And I will also just highlight that processing can be altered in three different ways. So first of all, it could be altered from the perspective of the speed at which the individual processes. 
It can also be the amount of information. So we all know that when we're fatigued or uh, ill, um, our ability to handle large amounts of information is compromised. We kind of hit that wall. And then the third area is complexity of information. So they have difficulty processing information that's abstract uh, and complex. We talked a little bit about the emotional changes. So it can, again, be on the spectrum from very heightened emotional responses and impulsivity to uh, the opposite, to flat affect, blunted emotional response, alexithymia, difficulty with um, even identification and recognition of emotion. Uh, and then there is certainly a large uh, prevalence of both depression and anxiety greater than that of the um, non-brain injured population. All of this, of course, impacts on behavior. And again, we see challenges with impulse control, emotional dysregulation, and changes in affect. So again, it's important to look at the whole picture. So what's not surprising is that all of these behaviors and all of these challenges can be misinterpreted as non-compliance. Uh, so if someone has uh, difficulty with attention and memory, um, they may miss their bail hearing. And it's not because they're uh, being defiant, it's because of their underlying cognitive problems uh, with, with their, uh, from their brain injury. Uh, flat affect or aggression can come across as rudeness, uh, defiance. Um, for those who have uh, flat affect or difficulty with initiating, uh, for those who have difficulty with the planning and organization and then being able to actually carry out a plan, uh, it can look uh, that they are poorly motivated, that they're not compliant with programs, uh, and this can also look like disengagement. And it's important to look beyond these uh, behaviors to understand what might be causing them and that they are in fact symptoms of the brain injury. Uh, they can also be symptoms of underlying learning disabilities, etc. Um, and and uh, addressed as such. Now we also know that the trajectory of the criminal justice system and this includes right from first responders to uh, interactions with police, frontline workers, probation and parole officers, formal proceedings within court, uh, bail hearings, court trials, all of these involve very complex social interactions that typically require high level and fast paced processing of information, understanding and responding. You add on to that that many of these individuals are often fatigued, uh, they're malnourished, they're not sleeping well, uh, we add in a component of anxiety, uh, and so the processing within uh, these situations and their ability to communicate to their best uh, ability can often uh, be significantly compromised. And this is really important for this population. So as uh, both uh, Flora and Angela mentioned, um, we know that TBI occurs across the socio-demographic spectrum. Um, however, evidence does suggest that there is a significant socioeconomic gradient with individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, are at greater risk. Uh, and we add in to um, this uh, uh, challenges with language and literacy that may go along with coming from a disadvantaged background. So as I just mentioned, um, these sequelae of TBI are often superimposed upon pre-existing language and literacy impairments. And then we've certainly talked about um, the mental health, substance use, and addiction challenges, and further exacerbated by poor sleep and poor nutrition. And uh, I'd like to share um, a, an, an acronym that was used by one of the um, individuals that we uh, spoke with, a staff member, and she used the term HALT. Some of you may be familiar with this, but it really spoke to me that many of these individuals on top of the brain injury, they're hungry, they're angry, they're anxious, they're lonely, and they're tired. And then you add that into the mix with um, the uh, cognitive communication and behavioral sequelae. So what's also very important is that there really is um, a general lack of awareness, in, even amongst the general population, about the impact of traumatic brain injury. And so this results in pervasive environmental, attitudinal, and information barriers. So this really is um, a marginalized population. As Flora uh, said, 
you know, this for the most part is a hidden disability. Um, most of these people look completely normal. There's not necessarily anything on the outside that would lead you to think that they have a disability. Um, they can often have a, a normal um, intelligent uh, IQ, intelligence quotient, and yet they can be functionally highly debilitated. So there is a difference there. So because of this lack of awareness, lack of training, lack of knowledge, uh, and all of these barriers, this can impede effective practice. So that's where we come in in terms of uh, this aspect of, of the research. So we recognize that caseworkers, frontline staff, first responders, legal justice system professionals need training in, first of all, how to identify what might be a traumatic brain injury, how to manage uh, the communication process. You're not taught how to modify your communication, how to identify environmental barriers to successful communication to ensure that the individual is really understanding and is able to carry things uh, forward. And also in terms of providing resources for those with TBI or suspected TBI, um, often it's not been formally diagnosed within the criminal justice system. So our component of the research, uh, we are currently conducting a qualitative research study, and this has been co-designed with our community partners, uh, including individuals with lived uh, experience. Um, and the end, one of the end goals of, of this uh, is to develop staff training materials uh, to understand the communication problems um, and to promote something that we call communication partner training. So I'm going to go on and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that, uh, what that is. Our research uh, involves in-depth semi-structured interviews with service users as well as focus groups with staff. And to date, we have conducted four interviews with individuals with lived experience and we've conducted two focus groups and we've been getting some really rich um, information. So the overarching aim, uh, one of our overarching aims is to improve the communication experience for both the clients and the staff. We recognize that it can be very frustrating for staff if they, uh, for whatever reason, are not being understood, um, if people are uh, behaving aggressively or appearing non-compliant because of challenges with communication, staff need support with this as well. So we're hoping to um, improve outcomes. Uh, we're also being hoping to be able to um, affect and inform uh, policy development and other KT materials as well. So what exactly is it that we mean by communication partner training? Well, it really is exactly what it sounds. We don't communicate in, an, in a vacuum. Every communication interaction involves at least two people. So uh, there has been evidence to show that for individuals who have communication challenges, that involving their communication partner in intervention or providing specific interventions for the communication partner um, can significantly enhance and optimize the communication process. So it is an evidence-based method of enhancing, optimizing communication, as well as the communication environment, uh, because that impacts uh, significantly on communication. Uh, and it involves a number of components. So it looks at how the individual can modify their own communication, uh, for example, even slowing down the conversation or chunking information, engaging the person with the communication difficulty in the conversation, um, and also identifying when specific communication breakdowns occur and being able to repair them. So evidence has shown that communication partner training can actually empower service providers um, uh, to help uh, give them greater knowledge and also confidence uh, in interacting with individuals with TBI. And so this, this has benefits for both the uh, service user as well as staff and service providers. So I just wanted to give you an example of one uh, particular study, and this is conducted uh, by our colleague Leanne Tor um, from her lab in Australia. And Australia and the UK are also really um, leaders in this particular field. And in 2004, they did a randomized control study where they actually trained um, police officers to help them with their interactions uh, over the phone with uh, individuals with brain injury. So this study actually evaluated the effectiveness of this particular training program. Uh, and the trained police officers actually learned strategies to successfully establish the nature of the individual's complaint, 
um, provide a clear answer to the inquiry, and then ensure um, an appropriate leave taking. And so what that means is being able to actually close the conversation um, and be more uh, efficient and focused in their interactions. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our whole team to talk a little bit about how you can get involved. Uh, Katie Almond, uh, who, as you know, is the um, head of the provincial uh, HSJCC, has written us a wonderful letter of support. Um, and so we have actually are in the process of submitting that to add the provincial HSJCC to um, uh, our uh, list of partners to whom we can recruit. So we would really love to uh, get your involvement. And I'm actually going to invite Flora and Angela to join in on this. Um, some of the ways that you can uh, get involved in, is in terms of helping us to recruit. Uh, we are aiming to over. Oh, do you want to talk? No, no. Are we? Um, thank you. Sorry. So we, we, we will uh, be uh, looking to you for help with, with recruitment. Uh, and we, uh, again, because we are going to be developing education and training materials, we'd be very interested in your feedback um, on their uh, efficiency, applicability, and, and whether or not they might meet your needs. So I'm going to turn it over to Flora. She looks like she might have a Nope. <laughs> um, I also want to say that, you know, we're, we're looking for opportunities to um, recruit people with lived experience, um, especially women. We'd like to oversample women. Um, right now, we only have one, one woman and three men, uh, which is uh, reflective of the criminal justice system in itself. Um, we're also interested in doing focus groups with people. So if there's any interest, once we have the REB approval, uh, we'll be reaching out um, to ask people if they would be interested in that. And so this was, it would be really helpful to talk to the, uh, any of your clients that you think would be um, suitable um, and to yourselves so that we understand how to create these materials so that they really work well for you. Um, and, you know, what's the content, what's the format, that sort of thing. So um, we're also doing this within the forensic health system. So we're also working with Waypoint. So we'll, we'll have a broad swath of people that we've, we're talking to. Okay, and it's Catherine here. I would also like to add, um, the client does not have to have had a diagnosed traumatic brain injury. That's an important point. Um, again, we know from the prevalence rates that there is a very strong chance, but it is really as if they have a history of hits to the head, the face, or neck. Um, then they are eligible for a screening in the study. Um, so even if you're not sure, if you suspect that that client might have that kind of a history, uh, please do um, uh, feel free to refer them. And we are doing some formal screening, uh, both at the intake recruitment process and then again um, at the onset of the individual interview. So just wanted to share that and clarify. Uh, yes, so from our perspective, um, Oh, go ahead. Oh, yes, absolutely. Sorry. So I will uh, just reiterate what we basically what we just said. So we really want to know from you what are the types of training needs that your members uh, would benefit regarding traumatic brain injury uh, and mental health and addiction. Um, the types of knowledge translation materials that would be most useful, and, and formats, and webinars, and um, uh, brochures, et cetera, and uh, again, potential opportunities for ongoing um, involvement. And, and I just want to say, and Angela, please um, um, chime in, but this is the start of a, a process where you know, this is the first step, and we'd like to uh, eventually build on this and um, uh, with through further funding, create interventions that might work appropriately for this population. So it really is the, this is the beginning point. Um, and we're starting with the training materials and then we will be building it. And we have a really great team and people have been re really responsive to us when we've reached out to the community. So we really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess uh, we, we won't be, um, if, you know, we won't be taking names or anything like that right now. No, just, no. We, I just we'll want to clarify that we are going to be getting REB approval first. And then we will, you know, be formally in the process of uh, recruitment. But this is just kind of like a heads up mm -hmm. in terms of um, 
you know what what the overall goal is and uh, and and uh, and thank you very much for that presentation uh, um, dr. Weisenhake in terms of um, uh, the information on communication okay so at this point I'm going to turn you back to Tasha uh, in case there is uh, questions or discussion points great um, so we have a couple of questions so far a few people had mentioned um, is that they might have candidates in mind. So just to clarify how I guess people should be should just, wait, just uh, keeping an eye out for an invitation to contact you. So it's Flora here. Um, yes, so we will be reaching out to the provincial HSJCC membership um, once we have REB approval. So you will be seeing something from us in the very near future. We hope sometimes REB takes a little bit of time, but we're hoping that we'll have a quick turnaround and we'll be reaching out to you. So we will be providing you with an information sheet, um, and and so you'll have everything that you need um, to approach clients about the study. So don't worry about that, and, and we'll also be reaching out for the focus groups. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so thank you again for this presentation. It was very informative. Uh, and I'd like to invite all of the listeners, if you have any questions about the presentation information, please uh, submit it. You can type them into the chat box. I have a couple of questions here so we can get started. Uh, this first one is um, a bit longer. It comes from someone who is a clinical forensic psychologist. And so they say, many of the patients I've seen in my forensic setting have, for a cognitive assessment have reported historical TBIs for which they were never adequate assessed at the time. Um, so by the time they end up with a referral to me, their challenges have compounded over time. Any suggestions on a systems-wide strategy to ensure appropriate services, i.e. reduce stigma in primary and emergency care for marginalized populations who are at increased risk of TBI? Oh, well, I, I typically... Don't cut, come on, whatever. Sorry. This is Angela. Uh, sorry. I, I typically always refer to the, I don't know where you're situated, but the Toronto Acquired Brain Injury Network. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I always refer to the um, Ontario Brain Injury Association mm -hmm. because they um, support persons with lived experience and they have peer support programs and they actually do go in uh, correctional facilities facilities to and provide information. So those are two sources of support that, um, but I don't know if you want to add to that. I, I, I just, I, I understand your question that there are very serious system, system barriers um, for people and you're talking about people who have had this injury previously many times and when they get to you they're in really serious uh, trouble. And so I think, and the stigma is really important, and the fact that it's a hidden, a hidden um, health condition is is part of that. Um, and in terms of the bigger picture, like you're asking about, we don't we don't have any strategies, but we, I mean that this is an opportunity for us to start working together to try to develop strategies, and especially through the HSJCC, the provincial HSJCC, and maybe an opportunity to come together and do some work on that. I guess there is also uh, Lynn Navigator, yeah. too. Um, I was saying the Provincial uh, Local Health Integration Network Navigator. There's one for every local health integration network. There is um, a navigator, a person, um, that's um, called for uh, acquired brain injury. And I know that they serve on numerous committees um, so that they are a resource as well. And I guess one of the issues, um, that has been identified as a lot of the existing programs are not tailored to these individuals. And again, it's like a lot of the brain injury programs have um, mental health and addiction as the exclusionary criteria and vice versa. There are some emerging programs, um, like I, I believe it's Center for Addiction and Mental Health, but, um, but I'm sure that they're not in every area of the province. It's Catherine here. I'm just going to move down another slide because we do have a couple of resources up here um, 
and I know that you will also have access, I believe, to the slides. So we have um, just included a few things up there for you. Great. Thank you so much for that information. Um, so I have another question here. It's, a, I think, just a clarification on something that was mentioned in the presentation. So you said a TBI does not have to include physical force to the head or brain. So could that include something like emotional force to brain, such as uh, childhood sexual abuse? So that's a good question. Um, what, when we talk about a traumatic brain injury, we are talking about a physical trauma. So um, emotional, uh, so many of these individuals do certainly have a history of emotional trauma and that is, is part of the package and I, I'm sure that Flora could expand a little bit on that. Um, but emotional trauma cannot cause a a traumatic brain injury with physical alterations to the well <laughs> we're we're waiting here so um it it is quite possible that there can be structural changes to the brain with repeated early emotional trauma that is developmental um it is not necessarily what we are referring to when we talk about traumatic brain injury and at this point I will turn that over to Flora to expand if if you feel you can <laughs> It's a, it's a valid question. Yeah, yeah. it is. And I, I think it, it's just to be clear what we, we're, that we're using the definition from the CDC on traumatic brain injury, where it is a, you know, it could be a blow to the head. It could be because the head is moved within the, the, within the skull and, and it, the movement has been so forceful that it creates a trauma, a physical trauma. A physical trauma. So, um, but I, I, I understand. I, I agree with Catherine, and I know that there's research that shows that, you know, the emotional trauma can structurally change the brain as well, um, but that's not exact, that's not where we're, that's not our definition that we're using for this particular project. I hope that's clear. Great. Thanks. Um, so another question. Um, so if someone has TBI and regularly confabulates, how might this problematize their interactions with judges, court, staff, justice workers, et cetera? Okay, that's a really great question. Um, I, I think, first of all, it's very important that um, the, uh, that the, the caseworkers and the legal professionals and the judge be made aware of that. Um, and there needs to be a lot of practice and rehearsal, um, uh, simulating what might happen in, in the court. Um, there could potentially be use of um, uh, strategies or signals between the, uh, the lawyer and the individual um, uh, that the judge should be made aware of so it doesn't look like there's something going on that's that's not appropriate uh, when the individual is confabulating but it really needs to be uh, included as part of any pre-sentencing hearings uh, and part of the records because confabulation is definitely a, a sequelae of TBI and it's 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 not um, it, it's not intentional on the person and they may actually have very limited insight so it's a, that's a very very important question um, I have a question, just what screening tool are you using? Okay. So uh, currently we, we, there are two screening tools. There is the HELPS, which is uh, I think more widely used within Ontario, but we actually for uh, this study we decided that we were going to use the Ohio uh, and that's what we're using. Um, another question related, will a person presenting with a history of hits to the head, neck, face, but without a diagnosis, receive a diagnosis from the screener? No. Are, we, are not, um, we are not diagnosing, and that is not uh, the uh, purpose of, of um, our, our research. However, it, it, uh, we then infer, based on that history, that the person very likely has a traumatic brain injury. Uh, TBI can only be diagnosed by um, a medical doctor or a psychologist. Sorry, just one moment. Yeah, no problem. Question. Maybe you can mention Latrobe as 
Oh, yes. Thank you, Flora. Uh, so we're also using uh, a screening tool called the Latrobe Communication Questionnaire, which was also developed uh, by our colleagues in Australia. And it has been um, validated in a, uh, a population of individuals with traumatic brain injury. And it looks at the individual's ability to self-report uh, specific challenges um, uh, with communication that can impact upon um, daily life and interactions within the criminal justice system. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so a question from someone who is a support worker for young males with TBI. And so they are wondering if you have any tips or advice on finding a job for these young men if they have a criminal record but are seeking employment. So they're uh, curious to know if uh, there are any common jobs you find um, people with TB TBI having? Mm, that's, a, that's a tough question to, to answer within perhaps the scope of, of, of this webinar. It's certainly a valid question. Um, I, I think that uh, if the individual has a significant brain injury, um, they tend to do well in positions where there is a lot of structure, a lot of repetition, uh, where maybe the pace isn't too fast, um, and where they have environmental support uh, involved, so that um, you know there isn't a lot of processing overload. Um, it would be really helpful to have a point person within uh, the workplace um, to support the individual, both from a social perspective and also a functional perspective in terms of carrying out the actual um, job tasks but it would be uh, somewhere where there are very clear expectations, uh, highly repetitive tasks that maybe don't have a lot of demands on um, uh, uh, memory and uh, divided attention um, and support for these social communication demands. And uh, I, hope, I hope that's helpful. I know it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bigger question than that. Great. Oh, yeah. do you want to? Yeah. I guess, um, I, I, what I didn't say in, in the webinar is that I'm a professor of occupational science and mm -hmm. occupational therapy, and um, their, this discipline is also very involved um, in uh, return to work. So an occupational therapist might uh, be a resource for you. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to add was on the environment, um, working, um, looking at, like, their sensitivity to light, noise, for instance. So there might be some environmental adaptations that could be done uh, because uh, these situations could uh, act as triggers. Um, and also um, workplace accommodations. Um, in some of our work, um, like we've done some work on our lab on return to work, mostly for milder injuries, but accommodations such as a flexible work schedule, for instance, um, you know, um, is is one example of um, the types of, uh, of what can make um, uh, the the return or an employment situation more successful. And then my just final point would be just asking questions and taking a look at the individual's sleep um, because that really impacts on cognition, communication, and behavior. So wherever possible, um, optimizing a stable um, sleep-wake schedule, too, and periods of rest built in to the workday um, if, if necessary or if, if need be. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question here, uh, they're wondering if this will be inclusive of FASD or able to be a starting point for FASD and the court system due to Okay, so another really great question. Um, we are not including FASD uh, in this particular uh, initial study. We recognize it's a significant issue, um, but we are not including FASD. That doesn't mean it's not very, very important. So going forward, perhaps. Okay, great. Um, so another person is wondering uh, if there's a time frame being considered for rolling out the communication partner training. They think it's something that is very needed. Oh, great. Well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, and yes, within 2020, so we are halfway through the grant already. So even though we are waiting for our uh, REB for the provincial HSJCC, we are actively working with our other community partners and actively recruiting. So um, we are aiming to roll out uh, materials um, uh, within 2020 
yeah, 20, it's 2019. That's hard to imagine. So 2020 is next year. Yeah, so that's our timeline. Um, so another question, uh, this person has worked with individuals who have post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, but some of the signs of traumatic brain injury seem to be in both. Is there a way to determine if, PTS, if it is PTSD or TBI, or is it hard to determine? Um, again, it's another really fantastic question, and yes, uh, a number of these individuals do have PTSD, um, and perhaps Flora can speak to uh, things like post-incarceration syndrome. Um, so yes, these can certainly uh, mimic symptoms of traumatic brain injury. They can also exacerbate. Um, in terms of teasing out, I, I think that that would in part be even just history, um, and it would certainly be helpful to get some um, medical diagnoses or psychiatrists, psychologists around that. If, if the individual is unable to access those uh, types of assessments to get that um, diagnosis, it, it is probably safe to say that it may be a combination of both, and we, we absolutely recommend that, uh, re recognize that. Uh, we also recommend you know, a, a trauma-informed uh, approach, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Flora to see if she has anything else she'd like to add. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I guess in terms of the post-incarceration uh, post syndrome, um, there's not a lot of research on that yet, but there seems to be a, a syndrome associated with actually being incarcerated and the effects of incarceration um, that is a, it's a kind of a subset of post-traumatic stress disorder. So um, for me, that, that what's happening in this population is that they have multiple needs and even the addictions can affect the brain as well. And Catherine and I interviewed a gentleman just last week, this week, mm -hmm. and um, and we were talking after the interview about you know his extensive extensive crack use for years and years and years, lots of assaults, lots of fighting, um, and and then brain injury. And so, how do you tease out all of those? What what's like what's what's causing the behavior? It's probably a mix of all of those things together. And then, you know, the anxiety on top of that. So he has difficulty um, in stressful situations because he can't process fast enough. And then he has the anxiety that keeps rising and rising and rising. And he used the term zero to 30. And, and so, like, he would just, his anger just rose. So I think it's really difficult to tease out the pieces, in my opinion, um, to see, you know, what really is the cause. And, in essence, does it matter? What we need to do is try to um, accommodate so that the, peop the people who are in the, just the criminal justice system or are potentially going to be in the criminal justice system have the supports they need um, in order to communicate and, so, and to alleviate that, that behavior, any behavioral issues that will get them in trouble. I, it's Catherine, and I, I would just like to add, though, in addition to that, I think it is helpful to work with the individual to identify what their specific triggers might be, mm -hmm. so that everyone who is working with them um, might be also aware of that, so that there can be, um, at least in the initial stages, um, some environmental modification mm -hmm. to support that. Um, and then uh, there are some uh, interventions to uh, for individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder um, that can help them in terms of reducing response to triggers um, and then also you know uh, talk therapies uh, that can help again the, the individual to recognize um, you know the onset of, of uh, a, a trigger um, and using uh, their own, whether it's CBT or other strategies to self-soothe or, or um, respond to those triggers. Uh, but it, again, that, these are all these are fantastic questions, and it, it is a very important uh, component. Great. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, so given that people with TBI often struggle with understanding cause-effect relationships, mm -hmm. how may this impact recidivism rates? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. It highly impacts recidivism rates. Uh, because you're, that is absolutely correct. They have difficulty um, judging consequences. Uh, so there are 
um, a lot of functional, uh, a component of some functional intervention strategies are to uh, to, to work um, supporting individuals with uh, with understanding and predicting consequences, um, and then being able to to follow through with that. So it, it plays a very large role. It's the lack of generalization, the impulsivity, etc. And I think yeah, Angela had a comment as well. Yeah, I just thank you for that. I I just want to add that um, I've also heard, and this is anecdotal, that some Individuals will reoffend to get back into um, the, the the where there's structure because it's so difficult when they leave that structure to go outside um, in terms of managing their environment. So it's almost desirable to this is what we've been told anyway yeah. to go back into a safe setting, what they perceive to be a safe setting. Yeah, yeah. that's a very important issue. Thank you. I, I know I'm not giving you the answer on <laughs> exactly what to do, but recognizing that it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. No, that's wonderful. Okay, thank you so much for all of this information. It was a really wonderful presentation. Um, so yes, we have all the contact information. I know there's some more questions and also some follow-up to original questions, so perhaps everyone can uh, direct, uh, contact you guys directly. Absolutely. Um, and look forward to more information about the study uh, moving forward. So thanks again to everyone for joining us today, and uh, we'll be following up with the presentation slides and information um, probably by tomorrow. So thank you guys okay. very much. Thank you so thank much. You everyone thanks, everyone, for being here. Appreciate it.